Welcome back, guys. Whoa. This is the next episode of Project Jackbug. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for the people that have started subscribing and made some comments on my first video. It's really good to know that people are interested in what I'm doing. So what I'm looking at today is the cooling system. In a moment, I'm going to take the camera. I'm going to give you a quick tour of the car and show you exactly what I want to do with the cooling system. Okay, so it's probably best if I start at this point of the car. So in each rear quarter window, I had some cooling ducts. I had an oil cooler and also the charge cooler radiator located behind the rear seat. You can still see the reservoir that I had in the back there for the charge cooler. So. Here we are inside the car. You can see the tubes that I had which ducted the air to the radiators. And the radiators were actually located down on the baggage area floor behind the rear seat. And you can see where I drilled some holes to allow the air to go through. So that setup worked to an extent, but it didn't work well enough. It was fine for everyday street use. I used to have no problems with my oil temperatures or with my charge temperatures just on normal street driving. However, I did do a few, a couple of track days. both occasions I saw the oil temperatures getting rather too high and I also had an issue afterwards with the turbo not making enough boost which I believe was possibly down to the bearing housing overheating. One thing I've observed whilst working on this car is I think I've found the reason why I didn't have enough air getting to the coolers. If you look along the car now that's the side of the car. I don't know about you, but I can't see any sort of intake, air intake. What I believe is the air was probably hitting the door pillar and bouncing off. Not much air was getting into this ducting. I do plan to still use this ducting, but for another reason. And I plan to add a scoop to allow it to catch more air. The scoop will come out further slightly further than the this door pillar it will allow any air that's rushing past the door pillar to be caught and go into the air scoops so here's the turbo it's a tdo4l from a subaru impreza wrx traditionally it is a water cooled turbo so the the water cooling is normally just in here there's an inlet and outlet just there and that's to help cool down the bearing housing now going on forums they will tell you that it's not necessary to have that the, the oil cooling will be sufficient so that's what I did I went with their opinion and generally speaking for road use it was fine it was only when I started seeing higher oil temperatures and higher charge temperatures on the racetrack when I was doing my track days, I would get this problem. It happened once and I put it down to using a second hand turbo, but then it happened again. It can't just be coincidence that each time I go on a track day, the turbo seems to struggle to then make boost. It feels laggy eventually it does just get stuck and doesn't make any boost and that's what happened to this one something i need to do is 
change the central housing, the CHRA. When I do that, what I plan to do is connect up the coolant lines. I believe that by having the coolant lines it will not only stop the turbo from getting too hot and coking up and dying, it should also help my charge temperatures as well because there's a lot of heat transfer that can go from this central housing into the compressor housing. So that's one of the reasons why I want to add a radiator and a coolant system to my car because I want to use it to keep the turbo bearing housing cool. The other radiator which I plan to put at the front is for the charge cooler. So the charge cooler radiator used to also be mounted behind the rear seat. Again for road use it was fine however every time I took it to uh, Lydon on a track day I would see the charge temperatures going up. I'd feel the safeguarding coming into effect, which is things such as reducing the boost pressure, retarding the timing, adding more fuel, and all of those things combined mean that you, you do lose power. I could feel that that was happening. I could feel that the safeguarding programmed into my ECU was, was actually coming into effect. I currently use a uh, charge cooler, also known as uh, a water to air intercooler. This is it just here. This was actually one that I had made up by a local company called Specialised Welding. This was put together, it used to be an intercooler, just a standard air-to-air -air intercooler from a Renault 21. What I did was I asked to have new header tanks welded on. What we did was welded a jacket around the cooling area. So where there would normally be air rushing through these fins, instead what we've done is welded a jacket around and we've had some water inlets and outlets. Actually, it's the other way around. Inlet and outlet. And what that does is it means that the core of the intercooler is now cooled by water rather than by air. The reason for doing that is in a, in a rear engine car, there's not a lot of airflow at the back. So it's far better to have a charge cooler because you can, you can cool the water a lot more easily by putting a radiator elsewhere on the car. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you now what I've done so far. Okay so here we are at the front of the car and the first thing you'll see is that I've had a new or a new old stock uh, valance put in there. Now I haven't had it welded in I've actually got it on some fasteners to make it quick release I'll just show you. It's the Aircon front apron and what this does is it's going to allow air to go into my radiators. So what we have is a nice big oil cooler. This is actually the oil cooler I was running before. This was the oil cooler that I had placed behind the rear seat. Uh, it's now going to be right at the front of the car and it's going to be in loads of airflow, getting lots of air. I can't see it getting hot. People run much smaller, smaller coolers than this on turbo engines and they never have a problem with heat. So if anything, I want to over-engineer it rather than under-engineer it because I don't want to have to go through all this rigmarole again. So the way I see it, it will be thermostatically controlled. So if it's a little bit overkill, it doesn't really matter because the thermostat will take care of the heat and ensure that the oil temperature remains at 80 or above. Behind it we have here, oh, move this one out of the way, so what I have here is a radiator from a Mark II Golf GTI and this radiator will be what I will be using to cool the coolant which is going to be going through the charge cooler. Again lots and lots of airflow all coming in through the front of the car so it should be much more effective. A second radiator also from a Golf GTI. So this one will be the one which calls the turbo. Now yes it's, it's overkill. It's overkill for just cooling a turbo bearing housing but uh, what I wanted to do was make my car future ready. So my future plans are to eventually go to a water boxer engine. That's going to be a whole nother series and it'll be a long time away. However, what I don't want to be doing is messing around with coolant systems further down the line. So what I'm going to do is fit this radiator there we 
are directly behind the first one and the air rushes straight through the both of them. So the next part is probably going to be where I will be making up some brackets to mount that second radiator. Once I've done that, once they're in place, the next step will be to run some coolant pipes under the car. That's going to be quite a difficult one. I don't have a ramp to work with. I'm going to have to just jack the car up as high as I can and crawl around underneath and make up some brackets to hold the pipes in place. Also, the way I'm going to route the pipes, trying to find a, a good route which doesn't interfere too much with things such as drive shafts. I was thinking as well, one thing with the coolant pipes, I was going to use aluminium pipes. Now, I've seen other people use copper and there's a few people who talk about galvanic corrosion. Now, I don't think it's an issue because the, the, the copper pipes will be insulated from the rest of the engine. What I mean by that is they'll be uh, joined by rubber hoses, which means that the metal won't actually ever come into contact with the aluminium in the engine. However, other people have said stick to aluminium, the whole engine is aluminium, the radiator's aluminium, so have aluminium coolant pipes just to ensure that you don't have any galvanic corrosion. It's all exactly the same type of metal. So just want to know your views on that one, whether you've heard of that before. And also what size coolant pipes to use under the car. Now my plan was to try to go as big as possible uh, purely because it gives more surface area. The, the pipes will act as a radiator, as, as a cooler as well as the radiator. So it's in my interest to have as big as pipes possible to make the system as efficient as possible. The problem with bigger pipes is they're more difficult to bend, they're more difficult to get parts for. My plan originally was to stick with the same size as the radiator outlets, which I believe are 32 mil. So my original plan was to go with 32 mil aluminium pipes. Try to find a pipe bender. I've seen some of those hydraulic ones that look like a bottle jack with some mandrels. So you kind of pump it up and it bends the pipe around these mandrels. So possibly use one of those. However, if I were to use a copper pipe, I could just use some solder on fittings and it would save me spending 150 quid on this blooming pipe bender. So let me know your thoughts on what sort of pipe or what sort of material I should use for the coolant lines under the car. Also, let me know routing as well. If you've ever routed coolant pipes under a beetle, let me know the route that you've taken. Again, my plan is to probably use the floor pan bolts and follow the, the line of the floor pan bolts but there's still that difficulty of getting it there from the engine past the drive shafts past the gearbox and then to the floor pans so it would be great to to hear what you guys think and get some suggestions on, on what i should be doing there it's not too late for me to change anything because i haven't done it yet so let me know so i'm going to wrap up now Sorry I've not actually done anything, again, I will eventually do some work on the car, but uh, I just wanted to put you in the frame, let you know where I am with the car currently. Uh, it's not too late to get your suggestions, that's the main thing I want. I want to get some suggestions, get involved with this as much as possible, and any sort of advice is always going to be appreciated. Thank you for watching. If you haven't already liked and subscribed, make sure you like and subscribe. Tell your friends, if you think that you have any friends that would be interested in what I'm doing here, then tell them to have a look at the channel. Tell them to like and subscribe as well. Hazard also has a Facebook page, so make sure you find Hazard on Facebook because I'll be giving some updates on there as well. And we also have an Instagram page, at Hazard Retros. So make sure you go onto Instagram, follow at Hazard Retros. To see any sort of updates I'll be doing in between these vlogs. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you on the next one. Bye bye.